Hi, my name is John O'Reilly. I'm from Akita International University, and I'll be presenting today on uh, two tropes that appear in many Japanese, in fact, almost all Japanese uh, blockbusters that deal with the topic of blindness or visual impairment. Um, the two tropes are sympathy and envy. So let's take a closer look. Um, I only have 15 minutes, so I don't know how well it'll go, but um, I do feel like just about every major hit movie uh, in the last 80 years in Japan that has dealt in some fashion with visual impairment has um, or can be separated into uh, more sympathetic or more uh, envious uh, responses to uh, blindness as a condition. Envy, that is uh, because, you know, purportedly super superhuman powers sometimes result in at least in pop culture <laughs> from uh, the development of blindness. Um, but it's really a spectrum and actually most of the examples that we'll look at today are in the middle of the spectrum so sort of combining the two. Uh, needless to say, neither of them are particularly healthy or uh, maybe appropriate responses to visual impairment in particular. Um, as you can see uh, here, they, they deny the possibility of empathy by othering the visually impaired individual. Um, to feel sympathy, one must feel that uh, one is uh, more fortunate than someone else, and envy is to feel less fortunate than someone else. Either way, it's an obstacle to empathy. Um, there are films that are empathetic towards um, the condition of visual impairment within Japanese society. And those films don't do well at the box office, unfortunately. Uh, and we'll talk about one possible explanation for why that is later on. This is, uh, it, you see on the screen here is um, Kawase Naomi's Radiance from, uh, from 2017, which is a remarkable film, but maybe actually as a result of challenging the kind of existing stereotypes of blindness in mainstream media, uh, specifically cinema, uh, it did not do well, or at least it didn't do, uh, you know, kind of enormous blockbuster level business. Unfortunately, it deserves to, but you know, <laughs> it's not up to me, unfortunately. But um, in fact, this film sort of denies the, the typical reaction of uh, to pity uh, someone uh, in the case of the blind individual being pitied by the sighted individual is that that's that subject position is is kind of rejected by the film, uh, which is quite interesting um, and, and very unusual. So there are many different cases, and this is definitely not an exhaustive list uh, of uh, depictions in cinema of in Japanese cinema, I mean, of blindness as something to be pitied or something to be um, that should evoke a viewer sympathy. And we'll just look at a couple of examples, one quite an extreme one, Kuroi Ame from 1989. And then eventually later on, well, also Kurama Tengu, but then uh, later on a little bit uh, more in depth about Gokuaku Bozu, this series of films starting in 1968, uh, which seems to be split almost evenly between sympathy and envy. So Kuroyame is interesting, um, partly because um, there's, you know, it, it, it goes into, this is the 1989 film directed by Shim, um, Imamura Shohei, who, who is talking about the, the atomic bombing of uh, Hiroshima and then dealing with the kind of spectrum of discrimination of people who are suffering chronic radiation sickness, or even who are suspected of suffering chronic radiation sickness in the aftermath, five years later, of the actual atomic bombing. And one of the things that develops out of this um, kind of chronic radiation sickness story is uh, several of the characters, at least two of the characters, uh, seem to be going blind as a result which is definitely worthwhile from a viewer manipulation point of view because it, it makes us feel sympathy for the people going blind as their kind of spectacle uh, of uh, losing their sight. But, um, the, you know, kind of the irony or the, or the kind of manipulation here is that there's no scientific explanation for um, chronic radiation sickness as opposed to acute radiation poisoning. Um, there doesn't seem to be any way that that could lead to blindness. So um, it's a kind of 
additional narrative uh, wrinkle that's added to enhance sympathy, but uh, doesn't actually make sense from a scientific point of view. So if we look at something like this, this is Yasko, one of the main characters of the, the film, and she uh, has some kind of a tumor and she's putting this uh, aloe salve on it. Of course, she has to see what she's doing to be able to do it. And we discover in this scene, uh, as I think you can start to sense, even just from the non-diegetic music here, that she can't actually see very well. Uh, and the mirror is a very powerful kind of mark of sympathy. The, in other words, I don't necessarily think we're meant to empathize with Yesco. We're meant to sympathize with her. Uh, her vision declining. Um, because we are seeing this happen. Um, and maybe that there's a kind of um, cruel irony in that as well. Um, Anyway, uh, one of the other uh, secondary characters also goes blind, and this is a uh, kind of interesting case here, uh, uh, actually around the same time in the film. I can send you the timestamps if you're interested. Um, where this character goes blind as the kind of last stage before inevitable death due to radiation sickness. Um, but this is five years after the uh, bombing, and it, I, I'm not a you know, expert in radiation, but I, I've never seen any scientific backing for the idea that um, radiation sickness can lead to blindness, uh, at least chronic radiation sickness. Um, so this is an addition by the uh, filmmakers, perhaps also by the uh, original source on which the story was based. Um, then uh, the final and most evocative, most emotional evocative scene is when Yasko starts not seeing things that are there and seeing things that are not there. Um, so there's this car, uh, carp kind of fish in the pond. And one of the characters, uh, her uncle says, oh, it's the biggest one I've ever seen. I've never seen it before. And she starts to see this, but we know in fact that she's not seeing it because we get a POV shot that's kind of blurry from her point of view. It's difficult for her to see anything, and indeed, at the end of the film, she essentially goes uh, entirely blind. It seems it is suggested that she has gone completely blind by the end of the film. So that's one way of treating uh, visual impairment on screen as a kind of, uh, well, uh, one of the terms that's come out by uh, a theorist named Jervis is this the um, spectacle of sympathy that the bodies of visually impaired or actually any other kind of impairment um, individuals are put on screen so that we can experience a kind of um, pity slash, uh, well, uh, re reassurement that, uh, that that isn't us. That is, uh, it's a kind of othering process. Something similar is happening in Kurama Tengu with this character, Oriki, uh, who goes for surgery um, to the real life historical uh, figure, uh, Hepburn, the eye doctor and missionary. And she is told in no uncertain terms that if she takes off her bandages before they've had time to heal, you know, like two weeks or whatever it is, uh, she will definitely go blind. But she's put into this high pressure situation where unless she takes action, um, her the, the man that she loves, Kurata Tenzen, which is to say, Kurama Tengu, uh, and indeed the country she loves um, in the, the form of the shipyard that's under threat will be destroyed by the dastardly foreigners. So she comes to the kind of dramatic conclusion that she has no choice but to risk blindness or really to guarantee her blindness um, in order to save uh, everyone, but especially maybe the man that she loves. It's a kind of romantic tragedy. Uh, we see here the, the kind of denouement at the end, where um, notice here that, that Ito Daisuke, the director, actually violated the 180 degree rule to make it absolutely clear that this is a big moment uh, in the film. Um, Kurata, who's struggling with the, the, the evil foreigner, um, is desperate to try and save her from this fate, but of course he can't. And not only uh, does she uh, accept blindness, she actually is shot to death uh, in about five seconds. So she suffers the ultimate fate. And yet there may be a sense in which we're a little bit envious of her courage, at least, 
uh, in risking all of this just to defend um, her, well, not lover, but, you know, the person that she's romantically interested in. And uh, I think it's also worthwhile to point out that there's a, a literal hidden transcript in the movie where she's able to write in this kind of unique way of poking holes in paper and the message, therefore, is only visible uh, with the use of kind of backlighting. Um, and Kurata is powerfully moved by this display of emotion or by uh, display of love. Well, um, that's more of the very sympathetic side. Then there's also a little bit more envious, uh, admiringly uh, envious side. Um, and one of the good examples of that is uh, Mimura Shinnojo from Bushi no Ichibun, or Love and Honor, the 2006 Yamada Yoji directed hit. Uh, I'll just show you this brief clip, which is the kind of big moment where we get a sense that being blind it may not be a disadvantage. Uh, I mean, of course, it's it, it's obviously a, a disadvantage in certain ways in, in a duel, but here we get the sense that he's made it work to his advantage, partly through um, kind of almost guaranteed uh, underestimation of the, the bad guy here. Um, but the most interesting thing about this moment is that just afterwards, um, as the man is struggling, wounded, but definitely not... Uh, fatal um, he is asked by a servant Toku, Tokuhei I think his name is um, are you gonna are you gonna kill him are you gonna deliver the, the kind of killing blow um, and he says no <laughs> which is uh, nice because it allows us to be uh, envious of his um, kind of underestimated abilities but also, n n we don't feel guilt uh, for supporting him. No, uh, he's, he's, he's maintained his heroic kind of attitude. And that's a powerful contrast to Gokakubozu, which we're about to see. Um, so yes, indeed, let's turn to uh, the more primarily envy-focused projects. Obviously, you can see on the screen that there are many uh, examples of this sort of um, blind superhero or um, you know, uh, some kind of person with with beyond human abilities um, from Star Wars Rogue One or um, Daredevil, whatever. Um, and there are many examples in Japan. Probably the most famous is Zatoichi, which we won't talk about today, but uh, could be a very interesting parallel to Goku Akubozu, uh, which is, you know, um, obviously directly inspired by Zatoichi in some ways, uh, starring the half-brother of uh, Katsushin Taro, no less. But, um, I, th I, I think we can all n notice if we sort of look carefully that uh, when villains show up in movies in Japan um, and they appear to be blind, they're either faking it as in Masquerade Hotel from 2019, or they're using it to become somehow beyond uh, human uh, kind of abilities. Of course, either way, we're, we're not meant to empathize with them, uh, but we might envy them in a sense. And a good example of this is uh, Daibosatsu Toge's um, Yunosuke, who goes blind almost as a kind of karmic retribution for his evil deeds. And yet he also enhances his fighting abilities as a result of this. So this is, could be an interesting case of um, primarily envy that we're meant to feel. Of course, it's still an alienating feeling. Uh, we, we can't really identify with as we don't take the subject position of Yunosuke, he's a kind of nihilistic monster, but we can envy his uh, enhanced abilities. And there are lots of villains like this. This is one from the Zatoichi series where Zatoichi, the blind uh, warrior and this blind crime lord fight. Obviously in that sense, blindness is no disadvantage since they're both blind, uh, but they are um, both superhuman as well. Um, and there could be an element of, uh, in the 1960s, after 1962, there was a uh, kind of concerted effort by many in the filmmaking industry to find ways to what we would call now jump the shark, uh, as uh, people were sort of leaving the cinema and watching TV a lot more. How are you going to draw people back into the movie theater? Well, one way is to, to introduce like a new, never-before-seen gimmick and then keep doing it until it's, uh, you know, kind of 
tried and true stereotype. That's exactly what happened with blindness um, as a kind of condition to, uh, well, a spectacle really on screen. Um, but one of the most remarkable spectac such spectacles of all is this one, uh, which is Goku Akubozu. As you see here, um, this is uh, the kind of key moment where the eponymous Goku Akubozu, the um, evil, wicked monk, um, blinds his opponent. Um, in a strange way, we might end up feeling sympathy for the opponent, Ryotatsu, here, as he's just been defeated in the duel. Uh, but we also feel envy by the end of the series because he becomes even more powerful as a result of his blindness and becomes the kind of arch nemesis of Shinkai, the uh, eponymous wicked monk. Um, so Ryotatsu was uh, actually, in some ways, almost more popular than Shinkai. Uh, and and ended up getting his own spin-off film later on. Um, then there's the the spectacle of Shinkai himself, who goes too far. Um, he he meets out uh, the punishment of blindness to people he considers morally uh, deficient. Um, and maybe as a result of this, as you can see here, um, he shocks everybody. Of course, he shocks the people who are observing this because it's kind of a awful violent moment but he also shocks the audience i think in 1968 when this movie came out um to, to think of someone who's that uh savage uh, not really an on-screen hero um but anyway we're almost meant to feel sympathy for these poor bad they're just regular yakuza you know they're they're not they're no match for him but he blinds them which is like too excessive and that's a nice contrast with shin no jo from Bushi no Ichibu. So it's a spectacle of sightlessness. It's considered, it's coded as a fate worse than death. He deliberately leaves them alive. Uh, well, most of them, uh, but he blinds them, which is like, you know, even worse, I guess, in the context of this movie. Um, so this all uh, goes to show you, or I guess uh, maybe could be taken to mean um, the films that, that work within these tropes are using what John Fisk has called the recognition effect. They're applying the kind of the existing tropes or the stereotypes that people are already familiar with and confirming them in the latest uh, you know, film projects, thereby avoiding alienating any of the audience members or sort of challenging the audience to think beyond these two uh, stereotypes. Of course, either way, um, this is a process of othering the uh, visually impaired individuals on screen, and by extension, anyone who's visually impaired. So I don't think it's a healthy response, but in order to fight beyond it, we have to sort of reward projects like Kawase Naomi's uh, Radiance with greater box office success, because until films like that sort of reach the mainstream audiences that are up to now being fed a diet of, um, you know, envy or sympathy uh, driven uh, depictions, then those depictions will never change. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your comments. The, uh, the idea of the filmmaker as the kind of evil mastermind uh, and sort of pushing a view onto, well, the culture industry view really, um, sort of interpolating the viewer with this kind of poisonous uh, ideology is, you know, that's totally valid uh, view, but we can also see um, the, the the recognition effect, the idea that, that people recognize what they already think is true um, actually depends on uh, the audience. So the audience is implicated in this uh, in a great uh, kind of, to a great extent. So if the audience, the mainstream kind of typical person, uh, Taro on the street in Japan, actually goes into the movie theater and uh, says, well, I, I don't recognize this anymore because I have, you know, friends who are visually impaired. They're not like that, right? Then the conversation will change because the filmmaking industry, I think, is is really more responsive than uh, sort of leading uh, proactive, uh, you know, kind of discourse on something like blindness. So I think ultimately change has to come from within society and then the filmmaking industry will eventually, perhaps reluctantly, start to reflect that changing consensus. 
Uh, so I, I don't know how to do that, but if anyone else has some suggestions, that'd be great.